Okay, we finally come to the proof of convergence of the exponential power series. And the proof will be pretty quick. But then I want to go and prove that it converges <clears throat> in a slightly nicer way, along with all its derivatives, so that it's differentiable and we can differentiate term by term. So that's optional part of the video. You watch the first bit and then watch the rest of it if you feel virtuous and are up for some sort of analytical self-flagellation. Um, so let's prove the convergence. So the way we're going to prove convergence is we're going to use this thing called the Weierstrass M test. Which, if you haven't come across it before, it's a nice way of checking that things converge. And it actually gives you a very strong form of convergence called uniform convergence. Don't worry too much if you haven't come across that before. Um, let me tell you what it says. So if f k of a is a sequence of functions, uh, so here remember for us a is going to be a matrix and f k is going to be the partial sum defining the exponential function. So uh, sum of one over n factorial a to the n where the sum is happening from um, n equals 0 up to k. this could be anything. So if it's a sequence of functions such that the norm of f k a is bounded above by m k for all k and all a. So here m k is just a number for each k. right? So f k is a sequence of functions, m k is a sequence of numbers, and this upper bound is holding independently of a uniformly in A. Then if MK converges to something, say M, so does the sequence FK. So FK converges and actually FK converges uniformly in, in A, if you know what that means. Okay, so that's what we're going to do, we're going to compute the, the matrix norm of this, we're actually going to compute the operator norm of this uh, sequence of partial sums and bound them above by something independent of A. And the problem is that's not going to work, right? So if you know anything about uniform convergence, uh, you'll realize the exponential function, the power series, doesn't converge uniformly. Um, it only converges uniformly on a bounded set. So if you put some bounds and look at the exponential power series in some bounded region, then it will converge uniformly. And that's what we're going to do here as well. So we'll assume that the operator norm of A is bounded above by some number R. Okay, and we'll prove uniform convergence on that set of matrices. And then, you know, you can take R to be whatever you want. So you prove convergence for your favorite matrix because you just take R to be sufficiently large that your operator norm is less than R. Um, okay, so that's our strategy. So let's let's compute the uh, matrix norm of this guy. So the matrix norm of the partial sum from n equals 0 to k of 1 over n factorial a to the n is less than or equal to well, by the, um, oh, I should say, whenever I write norm or say norm, I mean operator norm in this section of the of the video. Later, we'll talk about the L1 norm, but for now, everything's operator norm. So the operator norm of this is less than or equal to the sum of 1 over n factorial times the operator norm of a to the n. This is by the triangle inequality, All right? This is a norm, remember? That means that you can take the norm signs inside the sum at the expense of introducing an inequality sign. Also, we proved a lemma in the last video that said that the norm of a to the n is um, bounded above by the norm of a to the n. So we can replace this by sum from n equals 0 to k of 1 over n factorial norm of a to the k. 
okay. And now we're assuming that the operator norm of A is bounded by R, so we're going to use that here. This is at most the sum from n equals 0 to k of R to the k. Sorry, uh, this is a, an n, not a k, isn't it? So R to the n over n factorial. Now this quantity here, this um, sum from n equals 0 to k of r to the n over n factorial, that's what we're going to call mk. It doesn't depend on a anymore. And that converges. mk converges to exp r as k goes to infinity. So r is just a number, it's not a matrix. So I can use the usual facts I know about convergence of exponentials of numbers and the exponential power series uh, to deduce that this um, mk converges to x bar. So we can apply the Weierstrass m, uh, m test. The m test applies and we get convergence which is actually uniform convergence on bounded sets of matrices. Okay, we actually get slightly more if you look at the proof. In fact, we've proved absolute convergence. Um, absolute convergence means not only does this power series converge, but if you take norms of every term, the thing you get still converges. And that's, you know, all what well, that's what we did here, right? We took norms of all the terms and we showed that still converges. So this part of the proof, this subset of the proof, um, proves absolute convergence. Okay. And the absolute convergence is the thing that allows us to do rearrangements uh, without worrying about changing the value of the sum. So this is good. Uh, this is almost everything, almost everything we want, except we also want to be able to differentiate x a term by term. Right, we want to be able to take d by d something into the sum. And for that, it's not enough to prove uniform convergence. You have to prove that the partial derivatives of these partial sums converge uniformly as well. And this is where the nightmare begins. So, you know, if you've watched this far, that's good. Um, if you continue watching, do so at your own risk. Um, it's going to be fun, but it's going to be long and a bit messy. So you've been warned. So we still want to prove that the partial derivatives of the partial sums converge uniformly. Okay. So first of all, what does what does um, partial derivative mean here? Well, exp of A is a matrix whose entries are functions. And what are they functions of? They are functions of the variables A11, A12, up to A1n, A21, you know, a22, etc., all the way up to a n n. In other words, they're the functions of the matrix entries of a. So that is n squared variables, which I'm going to call a11 up to a n n. And when I say partial derivative, I mean partial derivative of a matrix entry of x a with respect to a matrix entry of a. So let's just, as an exercise, differentiate some functions like this right so um, what if I if I had a 1 1 a 1 2 and I try to differentiate that with respect to 
uh, A12, what would I get? Well, I treat the A11812 as independent variables and I'm differentiating with respect to one of them. So the other guy is kind of constant when I'm doing this partial der derivative, so I can ignore it. I just get A11 times dA12 by dA12, which is 1. So overall that would just be A11. Similarly, if I try differentiating with respect to A11 and I try differentiating A22, I just get 0, right? Because A2 is a completely different variable from A11. They're independent of one another. So when I differentiate, I get 0. So the thing we're interested in is d by dA i j of the partial sum uh, from n equals 0 up to k. And this is going to be a capital K because little k is going to end up as a subscript somewhere. Um, and this is of 1 over n factorial a to the n. And I want to take the kL, or I, I'll end up taking the kL matrix entry of that, but actually for now, let me not do so. Right, so I want, I want to do this, and I'm going to end up applying the um, Weierstrass M test to this guy, so I'll end up taking some matrix norm of this. Okay, this is the guy I want to prove converges. Want to prove that this guy um, is bounded, and actually I'm going to prove this in the L1 matrix norm. And it's bounded by something which I will call M capital K. And then that will allow us to apply the, the Weierstrass M test to deduce that this partial sum, or this is partial derivative of partial sums, converges uniformly. Okay, so that's the strategy. We need to bound this. Now we need to bound the L1 matrix norm, which if you remember, means taking every entry, taking its absolute value, and summing them. So what we really need to bound, if I get a new page, so we need to bound the absolute value of d by d a i j of the sum from n equals 0 to capital K of um, 1 over n factorial a to the n. And now I want to take the matrix entry k l. That's the thing we're aiming aiming to bound. Okay, so first of all, this is a finite sum. I can completely, without worrying about anything, take the d by d a i j inside the sum. So I end up with absolute value on the, the very outside, of the sum from n equals zero to k. 1 over n factorial d by daij of the kl matrix entry of a to the n. Okay, so let's just focus on, um, actually for a start, let's just focus on calculating the kl matrix entry of a to the n. What is it? Well, using index notation, I can multiply this um, matrix, this power of matrices out, I get uh, a very big sum over some new variables, which I'm going to call i1, i2, i3, up to i n minus 1. And then we get a k i1 times a i1 i2, all the way up to a i n minus 1 l. So these sums are happening, um, I've realized uh, that n is a power here and n was also the size of our matrix. So let's say a, um, a is capital N by capital N now. So this sum is happening over i1 equals 1 to capital N, all the way up to i n minus 1 equals 1 to capital N. Okay, this is just the definition of matrix multiplication. Um, so when I differentiate with respect to aij, what happens? 
Well, again, I can take it inside this big sum. I'm just going to write a big sum here instead of writing lots and lots of sums. Um, they're going to disappear in the end anyway. Um, so I'm going to differentiate now this, this product and I could use the product rule. So I get DAKI1 by DAIJ times AI1I2 dot 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 AIN minus 1L and plus another term where I differentiate uh, the second entry. So I get AKI1 DAI1I2 by DAIJ dot 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 up to A i n minus 1 l and then uh, I get a bunch more terms uh, all the way up to where I hit the last uh, factor in the product with the d by d a i j so I get the final term is going to be a k i 1 a i 1 i 2 all the way up to d a i n minus 1 l by D A I J. Okay. Okay. So it's getting messy. But the things I'm differentiating are just variables, single variables. I'm differentiating with respect to other variables. All right, remember the variables in this world are the A I J's. So if I differentiate A K I 1 by D A I J. I'm going to get either 1 or 0. I'm going to get 1 if and only if k equals i and i1 equals j. In other words, if I'm differentiating this variable by itself. Otherwise, I'll get 0. So that makes life a bit easier. So I'm going to write this in terms of this thing called the Kronecker delta, which is a symbol which is, uh, maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, it doesn't really matter. It's 1 or 0. And it's one if and only if the two entries I put here are the same. So I write this as delta k i, that's one if and only if k equals i, and delta i one j. Okay. So that is how I'm going to write this derivative. Um, and then there's a i one i two dot 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 up to a i n minus 1 l and the next term I get a k i 1 and then and some more deltas so there's delta i 1 i and then there's a delta i 2 j and then there's some more a's so the next one will be i 2 i 3 all the way up to a i n minus 1 l plus dot 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 and then the final term is a k i 1 a i 1 i 2 all the way up to uh, a i n minus 2 i n minus 1 and finally some deltas which is going to be delta i n minus 1 i delta l j Whew. okay hopefully I got all the indices right the likelihood of that is pretty small but um, Let's see. Okay, so nice thing, I can group all the following terms together and observe that this thing is just a matrix product. So in the first term, I have delta i1j, ai1i2 up to ain minus 1l. And I'm summing over the i1, i2, i3 up to in minus 1. So this thing I've underlined in blue that I just read out is actually the identity matrix times A times A times A and how many copies of A is it? Well it's one less than I started off with. I started off with n of them so there's n of uh, n minus one of them. Why do I say the identity? Well this Kronecker delta it, it's a way of writing the entries of the identity matrix right so the delta I1j is the i1 jth entry of the identity matrix. That's another way of thinking about it. Similarly, in the second term, I've got a k1, sorry, a k i1 delta i1 i. So that is the 
kth entry of the matrix A times the identity. All right, so in the previous one, sorry, this was the uh, J lth entry of I times A times A times A. And the second group of terms in the second term, the sec second group of factors in the second term is delta I two J A I two I three up to A I N minus one L. And that is, if you think about it, just the identity times a to the n minus 2 and then you take the j elf matrix entry okay so proceeding in this manner what I get is and, and now I don't need this big sum outside the sum actually disappears because I've done all the sums from i1 i2 etc in doing these matrix products so I just get delta k i times a to the n minus 1 uh, j l plus a k i a to the n minus 2 j l plus dot 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 plus and then the final thing will be um, a to the n minus 1 k i a uh, sorry a delta j l okay so as you move along this um, this uh, this sum what's happening is the you have two t two factors, right? There's an a to the something and a to the something else, and that the first something is increasing and the second something is decreasing. So, the, and uh, when there's a delta, that means it's really the identity matrix there. Okay, so things are starting to simplify a bit from a couple of lines ago, but it's still pretty yucky. Let's see the thing we're trying to bound. Let's get it down to our section of the page um, so we're trying to bound d by the aij sum from n equals zero to capital k of one over n factorial a to the n k -th matrix entry absolute value and what we've just calculated if we look was d by d aij a to the n k -th matrix entry so what we can now say is this thing we're trying to calculate is the absolute value of the sum from n equals zero to capital K one over n factorial times um, times this thing I've just written here with the deltas and the a's, which is, as it turns out, not going to fit on one line. Okay, first thing we can do to get some more control is we can use the triangle inequality for the absolute value and just take it inside the sum. So we get sum of 1 over n factorial of the absolute value of each of these things. Of the cost of this is, of course, we have an inequality instead of an equality. And we can also do the same to this internal sum. So we end up with... Uh, just taking absolute values of everything in, in sight. So we get absolute value of delta k i times, oh sorry, absolute absolute value of delta k i, yeah, times absolute value of a to the n minus 1 j l plus um, absolute value of a k i times absolute value of a to the n minus 2 j l plus dot 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 plus absolute value of a to the n minus 1 ki times the absolute value of delta jl. And I am correct in saying absolute value rather than norm here because we're taking entries of the matrices, so these are just numbers. So I'm going to get a new page. Okay, we're nearly done. It's not too far off. Um, so the strategy will be for each of these terms inside the sum we want to bound it from above um, so and those terms are all of the form a to the something let's say m k i times a to the something else which is going to be a to the n minus m minus 1 j l 
So we want to bound uh, these kind of products. So let's just see what happens if I try and bound a k i to the m. What do I get? Well, this is certainly less than or equal to the L1 norm of a to the m. Because the L1 norm of a to the m is just the sum of all the absolute values of matrix entries, and this is one of those matrix entries. So this gives us an upper bound. Also, the L1 norm is controlled from above by the operator norm because they're Lipschitz equivalent. So this is less than or equal to some constant times the operator norm of a to the m. And last time we used the fact that uh, the operator norm has this nice property with respect to matrix multiplication. So this is now less than or equal to c times matrix norm of a, or operator norm of a to the m, where the exponents is now outside the operator norm. Okay. What I really want here is an L1 norm, and I can get it back to being an L1 norm because they're Lipschitz equivalent. So the operator norm of A is bounded above by some constant D times uh, the L1 norm. So I don't remember what letters I used uh, in, when I talked about Lipschitz equivalents. It doesn't really matter. These are just some constants. So what I end up with is C times D to the M times A L1 norm. So the thing I'm trying to bound here is now less than or equal to a product of these things. It's going to be C times D to the M A L1 norm times again C times D to the N minus M minus 1. Oh, sorry, there's a factor of M there, right? Sorry, the um, in the, the upper bound should have a norm A to the M. And so I end up with uh, norm A to the M here and also a norm A to the N minus M minus 1. So this simplifies. This is just C squared times D to the N minus 1 times uh, matrix norm of A, the L1 norm, to the N minus 1. Okay, so let's stick that back into our uh, inequality up here. The thing we're trying to bound, I'm going to copy and paste it again because I don't want to write that out. So this is D by D A J A I J of the partial sum of the exponential K L entry, and I'm taking the absolute value, and this is now bounded above by the sum 1 over n factorial times, and now I have n terms in this sum, um, and each term is bounded above by c squared d to the n minus 1, norm of a to the n minus 1. So I just get n lots of c squared d to the n minus 1, norm a to the n minus 1, and that's the L1 norm. Okay, now. We've got an n and an m factorial, so this is just a uh, sum of 1 over n minus 1 factorial c squared d to the n minus 1 uh, norm a to the n minus 1. And now this is bounded because, again, I'm assuming that a is bounded now in L1 norm by some constant r. So what we get is this is at most c squared times um, exp of d times r. Okay, so I've skipped a few steps, kind of put them all together. But the, the point is that this, um, this sum here is basically exp of d times the matrix norm of a, but the matrix norm of a is bounded above by r. So this is basically the expression for exp dr. Okay, and this is uniformly bounded, this is a uniform upper bound for this sum here, and that tells us that we can apply the M test and 
the partial derivatives of the partial sums converge uniformly. on compact sets or unbounded sets. Okay, so why was I doing this? I was doing this so that we would know exp is differentiable and when we're taking derivatives we can just take d by d whatever inside the infinite sum. Okay, so for those who stuck with this to the end, well done. If you spotted any mistakes, even better, do let me know about them.